Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the podcast. And our sponsor this week is the JAEC Foundation, which is hosting an international conference on open dialogue this August. And you can visit the website jaecfoundation.org for more information. And now on to our interview. And this week we hear from Dr. Niall McLaren. Niall, known to many as Jock, is an Australian psychiatrist who worked for 25 years in the remote north of the country. Jock is also an author, and his latest book is entitled Natural Dualism and Mental Disorder, The Biocognitive Model in Psychiatry, and it was published in December 2021. Recently retired after 47 years, Jock joined me to talk about his experiences working in psychiatry and why the models that purport to guide psychiatric diagnosis and treatment are not what they seem. Dr. McLaren, Jock, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today for the Madden America podcast. So I, I wondered if to kind of get us underway, if you could tell our listeners a little bit about you and, and what it was that led to your career as a, as a psychiatrist. I'm from the rural areas of Western Australia. Um, and so you study in Perth. and I'd never seen the university when I got there. So it really was quite an outsider all along. But then when I graduated, I was very interested in neurosurgery. Uh, originally, I wanted to be a country GP. But then I, after six months in neurosurgery, I was very interested. So I actually started doing the surgical training. But they put me into a term in psychiatry just to fill, it, fill up three months. And I realized then that was what I actually wanted. It, it's big ideas. Psychiatry is big ideas, and it's dealing with people directly as distinct from neurosurgery where they're all unconscious. So it just went from there. And I'm you know, very happy. As you know, I've just retired after 47 years in psychiatry. Uh, but I don't regret that in for one second. I, it hasn't been easy, but I don't regret it. Absolutely. And you spent some time kind of in the rural north of Australia, didn't you, which I guess must have presented some fairly unique challenges. That's a nice way of putting it. Um, in 1987, uh, I left Perth and went to the Kimberley region, which is one of the most isolated parts of the English-speaking world, and was there for six years. Uh, but um, I was married during that time. We had a baby. Uh, and it was was quite it was getting quite dangerous. The work was getting dangerous, and I thought it's what's acceptable as a single bloke is not acceptable when you've got a family. So we moved to Darwin, which is only marginally less isolated. And I was there, so I was in the north for twenty five years, and then we came down south. Um, and so we've been here for about ten, just on ten years in Brisbane. And can you tell us a little bit about how psychiatry is practiced in Australia? So, so does it tend to follow a kind of US and European um, biomedical approach? Yes. Psychiatry here um, is split very much between private and public practice, and university is considered public practice. I've never worked in a university, but of course I've worked in both private and public. And public psychiatry is, I'm sure, exactly the same as in the UK. A lot of the people who work in it, a lot of the psychiatrists are from the UK or they've trained there or they've been there. Uh, so very heavy influence of places like the Maudsley. Um, not, I would say, a um, benign influence, but that's just my opinion. Private practice is different. It is very, very much Central, uh, central city practice. There are very few pra private practitioners in the outlying areas, uh, and they um, are there essentially to make money, and that's what they do. Um, so I was actually in private practice for the last 25, 20 years, I think, but I was running what's called a bulk billing practice, which means that I didn't bill the patients directly. I billed the government. And so I only got 85% of the fee. 
whereas a, pri- a, a full-time private practitioner can charge what he likes. So some of them were charging three times the recommended fee, whereas I was only getting 85% of it. But, you know, I was doing the sort of work I wanted to do. I was working in working class areas with um, you know, high levels of family breakdown, unemployment, drug problems, a lot of refugees, a lot of immigrants, and a lot of movement. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, it's just you've got exactly the same in the UK. You've got your private practitioners all squelched into one small area, and then you've got this vast wasteland which is unserviced. That's what interested me. And, and I wanted to ask, Jock, you know, how, how are the needs of Australian First Nations people taken in, into account of if they are in, in standard practice? Because, you know, it's important to kind of look at cultural difference, isn't it? So I wondered what your experience was of that. Well, I went to the Kimberley region um, with the express purpose of providing a service on the ground. There had never been anything like it. Uh, so I was there for six years. My job was to stop Aboriginal people being sent down to Perth. And Perth, from where I was, is further than London to Moscow. And the cultural differences for Aboriginals are probably about the same. They're completely different people. They speak different languages. And there was very little understanding of them in the, in the mental hospitals. Once they got into the mental hospitals, they just got the standard biological approach, same as they would get in the mental hospitals in the UK or the US. Uh, and, of course, it didn't work. They would be there, stuck there for months on end. So my job was to stop them being sent there, and in that sense it was extremely successful. In the six years I was there, it dropped from 50 people a year being sent down to Perth to one or two. Most of them were not admitted to hospital. They, they could be managed at home. If you're on the spot, you're moving around, making contact with the local communities, making contact with the Aboriginal people and themselves and their families, you can manage things. You don't need these big hospitals and institutions. They're inherently inefficient and hugely expensive. So it, was, it saved the government a great deal of money just having one psychiatrist on the spot. But it was damned hard work. Yeah, I bet. And, and, and also, as well as saving money, no doubt, it's better for the individual, isn't it, to be kept in their local community and, and have their needs met there rather than sent to a place that they re- don't recognise. There is no comparison, absolutely no comparison from their point of view. They were happy to be treated at home. And I got known... People would be sitting waiting when I arrived. They knew when I was coming. We'd be talk. We'd get on, get things done. Made life a lot simpler. Unfortunately, they haven't persisted with that model. They've reverted to a large extent to a more mental hospital type approach. Um, and I don't think that's very good. I think that's retrograde. But there you are. That's how it is. Doc, in, in your writings, you, you've written a great deal about the problems of psychiatry's reductionist biological model. So I, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about your view of the shortcomings of that model, particularly how they might impact on the person in the street who comes in for treatment and, and is trying to figure out what's wrong with them. And, you know, as you said yourself, you dealt with a lot of um, poverty and unemployment and those kind of things. And yet people might be coming in thinking they've got chemical imbalances or genetic predisposition or or, or those kind of things. So I I just wondered if I could get your view on the shortcomings of this kind of biological model. Well, um, just tell you a little bit about my background. When I was in Perth, uh, not long after I graduated in psychiatry, uh, I started writing what was obviously philosophical stuff. So I then started a PhD jointly in philosophy and psychiatry. Uh, And unfortunately, when I left Perth to go to the Kimberley, I couldn't continue that, so I had to give it up. I never completed the PhD. But as part of that, I had to do some undergraduate units in philosophy. Um, And there are not very many psychiatrists who have done that. And so I've maintained that interest um, all along. That's what I do. after hours at work, I'm a psychotherapist. So the first thing that became obvious is, so coming into psychiatry from neurosurgery, uh, 
I realised that what the professors were saying about mental disorder and chemical imbalances uh, and all that sort of stuff, I, I knew it was false. It was simply wrong. And that's where things went bad, because I would say to the professor, who was a very rigid Scotsman, uh, I'd say, well, look, I don't think that's actually right. And he would be so angry and just freeze and then freeze me out. And that was part of the reason I left Perth is because my PhD was just going nowhere. I was was not getting no support. I was actually getting hostility from the psychiatry department. Um, so it is a fact, an established fact. There is no biological reductionist model of mental disorder. It has never been written. That's the end of that. There is no chemical imbalance theory. It doesn't exist. That is a trope that's thrown around. It's beaten up by the drug companies. It's beaten up by, we say the women's weekly, but you must have some sort of equivalent thing there in the UK and the US. It's, it's the sort of easy thing that can appeal to the masses and it's just ladled out and they suck it up. And yes, people do come in saying, um, oh, my doctor's told me I've got a chemical imbalance of the brain. And I think, well, sure. let's just put that aside. Let's focus on your life as it is um, and we will see where we go from there. And that, doing that, you don't have to use drugs. For example, I've seen personally assessed and managed um, well over 12,000 cases in a wide variety of settings, mostly alone. So I had no support in the Kimberley, none whatsoever, and um, had to manage people. A lot of Aboriginal people didn't speak much English at all. They don't speak English at home. Uh, And had to manage there um, without using drugs, without ECT. I've never used ECT. uh, And using minimal levels of drugs, um, my, the only time I've ever looked at the figures, I was actually on the third percentile of the prescription rate for psych, uh, antidepressants for psychiatrists. That's third. And the other 2%, they were psychoanalysts. <laughs> they don't use drugs. So, yes, you can, but it's different. You've got to practice a different sort of psychiatry. It has to be biological. It has to be psychological. It has to be sociological. And I put a lot of emphasis on personality assessment, whereas, of course, psychiatry doesn't have a model of personality. So there's no model, biological model of mental disorder. Psychiatry doesn't have a model of personality or personality disorder. And you're, you're sitting there, I can see you're going to say, but what about the biopsychosocial model? It doesn't exist. Right? That's that. I have just had probably my 20th paper on it. Uh, Most of the papers get published, but this one's been rejected repeatedly. Uh, And it says that um, psychiatry's use of the biopsychosocial model meets the criteria for fraud. So I've quoted lots and lots of um, quotes from psychiatrists in the UK, Australia, around the world, are saying this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, this is wonderful, we've got this fantastic model and we're really flying high. Then I look at the sociology of psychiatry, then go through Engel's paper, this is George Engel from 1977, practically line by line and show that it has no ontology, it has no uh, um, statement of his opinions, it's got no, it's got nothing. So then I have quoted from the Queensland Criminal Code, the section on fraud, and it meets the criteria. Now that paper's been rejected. I will get it published. Let me just read out what the, the reviewer said. The reviewer said, this article is not written in the form of an academic work. It had 39 citations. It is more an opinion piece, but not one that could be credibly published in an academic journal. That, to me, is reprehensible, but it's also emblematic of the point the paper makes. So we'll get it published. But anyway, so that's so much for your biopsychosocial models. That means psychiatry is operating without warrant. 
there, there isn't a biomedical model. They talk about it. It isn't there. Who, who wrote it? Show me. I would love to see this thing so I could rip it to bits. I would love to see it. It doesn't exist. So then you have Ronald Pease, or Pies, however he pronounces it in the US, um, ed editor of Psychiatric Times or whatever it is, I don't know, uh, who's saying, no, 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 hammering the table, saying it's the biopsychosocial model. This is the guide for our practice, and it's been this way for 30 years. I've said, to, I've challenged him, show me it, produce it. He didn't answer. They never answer. Time and time again, um, I challenge people, show me where it says in that paper, this is my biopsychosocial model, because it doesn't say it. So psychiatry is operating without a warrant. And that is a very, very serious state of affairs. So, so you, so your your view. I think you write in your book, which we'll come on to in a second, that the the biopsychosocial model is a mirage. It doesn't really exist as a cohesive kind of entity, and maybe similarly to the chemical imbalance, it's there to to palm off difficult questions rather than to be something that people use in everyday practice. It's it's just it's a fig leaf. Um, it's a fig leaf which conceals the fact that psychiatry doesn't have an established, articulated, publicly available model of mental disorder. And it's also a distraction. It's hand-waving. You know, there's that terrible sense of, oh, don't worry about the details. You know, we'll, we'll sort that out later. You hear this from the academics, oh, but that's in the literature. You should be familiar with the literature. Well, actually, I am. And that's why I'm telling you there is no model of mental disorder available to modern psychiatry, and therefore modern psychiatry fails to meet the basic criteria for a science. That's interesting. Thank you. Absolutely. Unequivocal. <gasps> yep. So, Jock, turning now to your most recent book, which you, you kindly shared with me, it, it's entitled Natural Dualism and Mental Disorder, The Biocognitive Model in Psychiatry, and it was published very recently in, in December 2021. Um, I, I just wanted to read a little bit. I hope, I hope that's okay. In the book you write, the biocognitive model for psychiatry represents a total break with the past. It is highly developed, far-reaching in its scope, firmly based in well-established principles from other fields of science, and leads to dramatically different ways of seeing old problems. More to the point, it says, practically everything we are doing in psychiatry today is wrong, if not frankly destructive. It offers a new model of treatment that shifts the focus from blind meddling with the brain's function to seeing humans as information users with the capacity to get caught in self-sustaining mental traps. However, it also says we are dangerously irrational, which must be taken seriously. While this may be shocking for some, we ignore it at our peril. Now, you know, that's pretty powerful stuff and certainly spoke a great deal to me. So, um, you know, I wondered if you could help by, you know, telling us a little bit about the biocognitive model and, you know, how it differs from the kind of thinking you were talking about, you know, in terms of diagnosis and, you know, brain chemical imbalances and, and that kind of thing. The dominant theme in modern psychiatry is that each mental disorder is unique and or is categorically unique and that the um, job of the nosology, that's the classification system, is to sort out these discrete entities and then ultimately they will be mapped down onto the genome. And so for each discrete mental entity, there will be a discrete um, error in the genome, which ultimately the goal is there will be a drug for each mental disorder. That's what modern psychiatry is all about. That's what it does. All of that is without warrant. Um, that's all there is to that. Uh, so the biocognitive model, and that's just a name I tack onto it because you've got to have a name, um, starts with the most basic fundamental principle that we are information processors as humans. But we're very complex information processors. We've got these peculiar things called emotions. So that's much more complex than something sitting on your desk that just barks at you. Um, and so we've got to give account for that, but we have to start with the most basic point and build up. Psychiatry goes the other way around. They started with what with the uh, with the 
clinical impressions and they've gone backwards. They're going backwards all the time and it's not working. So the biocognitive model says that there is no physical cause for mental disorder. Um, psychological account is possible. Here it is. And it can account for all mental disorder. So the mental disorder becomes a psychological phenomenon. Sure, very complicated. I don't say it's simple. If it's simple, we're probably wrong. So mental disorder is uh, essentially psychological. And that's how it has to be assessed. That's how it has to be understood. And that's how it should be managed. So giving people brain destabilizing drugs, doing things like giving them ECT, um, implanting things into the brain, filling them with narcotic drugs like ketamine, all that sort of stuff, the old surgery, um, the leukotomies. Uh, and I assisted at the last leukotomy in Western Australia. Um, and at the time, I was just a neurosurgery resident. I didn't know. He said, we're doing this, so there we are. Uh, and those things are entirely without warrant. They simply, there's no justification. It doesn't exist. And the problem is that there are so many people um, who are so heavily committed to this idea that you know, you're, it's really, you've, I don't know, it's, you're fighting a rearguard action all the time. The, the model isn't meant to be simple. I don't think it's simple. But the concept of self-sustaining anxiety is pretty simple. That we get caught in self-reinforcing, self-sustaining traps of anxiety. But we do that in other things too. We get caught in self-sustaining traps of aggression. And you can see one going on in the Ukraine right now. So we get caught in self-sustaining loops. One of the big one is anxiety. Aggression is another big one. And depression can become a self-sustaining loop too. Uh, and that's where it becomes terribly important to understand the person as a person. Why is this person in this position in life right now? And that's the, that's the therapist's job is to sort that out. Thank you, Jock. You know, it's again, you know, something you wrote in the book spoke to me that you point out early in the book that many of history's great thinkers would probably today receive receive a host of diagnoses. So it made me wonder if if that's part of the issue can, that we can't tolerate difference anymore, difference of behaviour or difference of thought or difference of culture. Yeah, there is this tendency to homogenise ourselves, and you just see it. You know, I have this with my kids all the time. You know, why are you listening to that crappy music? <laughs> it's why do you wear your cap backwards? Uh, things like that. Why do you homogenize yourselves? Where's the individuality? Um, yeah, so that, that's true. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of great people were uh, very difficult people, like Santiago Raman Yacajal in Spain was one of my heroes because he was such a difficult person. Um, and yet he achieved at this high, high level. Uh, his father took him out of school because he was such a little little rat bag. Uh, they had to take him out of school. And then in these days, he'd be put on drugs. That'd be the end of it. So, yeah, there are a lot of um, great people. This is why it's very interesting. So Descartes would have been called, and Descartes, another person, another writer whom I rate very highly, he would have been labelled as autistic, um, and lots of them, so many of them. But yeah, I don't know what's happened to us. We fear, we fear individuality. I think it's fair to say you, you take the view that more psychiatric treatment has led to worse outcomes overall, which you know seems like a pretty damning assessment. But you know we see long-term outcomes so little discussed in the literature, don't we? So you know I wondered, is there evidence that we can draw on that this is commonly the case? Well, if if you want that, just look at Thomas Insel, um, the uh, former director of the National Institute of Mental Health. He was there for thirteen years. And in 2015, he gave an interview after he'd left that job, and he said, um, we haven't budged the needle at all. We've, 
He said, I've spent $20 billion on research. We got lots of cool papers published by cool scientists, and we haven't budged the needle for the mentally disordered one iota. I mean, who? what else do you want? That's a good enough authority, isn't it? Yeah, and you're right. And he's confirmed that again in his recent yeah. book, hasn't he? Which... Um Bob Whitaker put a, an article on Mad in America about, and again, it, it 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 does talk a lot about that, but it doesn't really talk very much about long term outcomes for people. And surely that's the measure of this, our success at helping people with mental health struggles is do they go on to live long, meaningful lives? And that isn't really discussed. But there's always a problem: is that we actually haven't got very much to compare it with. So this is why somebody like some research, like David Healy's work, looking at figures from the mental hospitals. 130 or 40 years ago, that's very valuable. Things were a lot different then. I can remember people did not come in and out, in and out like they do now. They were not, you did not see people on six, eight, ten different psychiatric drugs. Um, there were nowhere near as many people uh, going into hospital um, at, with the same regularity. It didn't happen. This thing called rapid cycling uh, manic depressive psychosis or bipolar disorder, that didn't exist in 1976. I can tell you now, it did not exist. Um, but it, it does now. Why does it now? What's changed? The only thing that's changed is the drugs. That's the only thing. And I, I guess then, you know, you know, you've done a great job over many years of, of kind of you know, describing the many problems in the way that psychiatry operates now. And, and in your book, you, you quote Richard Buckminster Fuller, and, and he said, you never change something by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the current model obsolete. So, you know, how do we go about making the current model obsolete when so much power shapes and controls it? And there's so much power inherent in the model that psychiatry operates to now, isn't there? Well, I think that that's true. Um, and that's why I wrote that article recently entitled Why Do We Lock People Up? Uh, there's no justification. It's just the way it's always been done. Why do psychiatrists have this immense civil power to lock people up, to deprive them of practically the whole of their human rights on hearsay evidence? Um, where does this power come from? Why is it there? Uh, and what's the justification? There is no justification. There is no model of mental disorder. This is a fabrication, and it's necessary to expose it. You know, but I've been knocking politely on the door for the, for decades. You get absolutely nowhere. So that's why I think it's important to say, look, here are, here is this biopsychosocial model. This is you you say this is what he actually wrote. Here's the law on fraud. Why is this not fraud? Why are you people not conducting a fraudulent enterprise? You must justify it. So, Jock, I, I, I'm sure that you've you must have thought about this. You know, if, if you if you had the power to make change in the way that we react and respond to people suffering all kinds of mental distress, you know, what what what's the biggest change that we could make that would dramatically reduce the number of people exposed to harm uh, either through the use of drugs or, or, or the use of ECT or you know or even helping them believe that there's something disordered in their brain when that probably isn't the case you know what could we do to make things different do you think the first thing is for psychiatry to accept that it does not have a model of mental disorder stop touting this chemical imbalance of the brain stop spouting things like a medical model or a biomedical model. Stop saying that um, basic research, brain research will tell us all we need to know about mental disorder. Stop saying there's a same thing called a psychosocial, biopsychosocial model and accept there is no model and psychiatry really needs to go back to square one and start. As it happens, I have a model. I've put it there. You can have, you can have a look at that. You may not agree, but at least let's start talking seriously instead of all sitting around saying, yes, 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 we've got a model, haven't we? Uh, yes, yes, we most certainly do, yes. So, and there is no model. It doesn't exist. It's a fraud. It's as simple as that.
does psychology or psychotherapy need a model to adhere to, do you think? Yes, you have to have a model that tells you what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Otherwise, we end up out there with this uh, ritual satanic abuse, alien abduction, multiple personality, blah, blah, blah. Right? You, must, you must have a demarcation criterion separating valid science from fanciful nonsense. And that's terribly important. The history of psychiatry really is a history of fanciful nonsense. I don't know why I do this to myself, but I'm reading Andrew Skoll's book at the moment. Then there's Anne Harrington's book, Mind Fixers. I mean, the information is all there. All we've got to do is convince people, read this, but psychiatrists won't read that. They, talk, they only talk to each other. They don't talk to anybody else. And they exclude critics. And I think a lot of that goes back to Thomas Sass, who um, really was, went too far, in my view, to say that there's no such thing as mental disorder. That is sim- and he's, he's quoted in, in one of his books. He says, soldiers um, who complain of mental symptoms are just trying to evade their duty. That is such a brutal, brutal thing to say about a person with a post-traumatic state. Thomas Sass fed mainstream psychiatry the reason to avoid critics, and they've been doing it ever since. Psychiatrists have got to get out of their echo chamber and start accepting criticism. And do, do you think there's much chance of that actually happening? I mean, obviously I'm aware myself of, you know, there's, there's quite a healthy critical psychiatry movement in the UK and, and there has been for some time you know I, I see more and more people speaking out more and more books being written on this but yet academic psychiatry feels quite remote and entrenched so you know w- will they change do you think I think it I think it will collapse when people like Thomas um, Insel say we promised you that basic research would answer all questions about mental disorder with no questions unanswered. That was essentially what they promised in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, These drugs, they said, are safe, they are effective, uh, they have minimal side effects, you are silly not to take them. It now turns out that that is all false. And eventually it will collapse. It will collapse, that's all there is to it. I would like to be alive to see it, that's all. One thing that troubles me. You know, a lot of things annoy me, but this troubles me is what is being done to medical students and trainees in psychiatry. And essentially, they are being brainwashed. They're being fed a line which has no justification. And I've asked medical students this quite a number of times. On your first lecture in psychiatry, when the professor walked in and said, welcome to psychiatry, what was the model of mental disorder that he, gave, that he gave you? And they have always said he didn't. He just started talking about genomes and neurotransmitters and drugs and ECT. So that is not science, right? That's not science. That's not how science is conducted. That is called brainwashing. And, you know, this is, this is a tragedy. The majority of medical students... Don't, they're just not interested in psychiatry, um, and they get and they just turn away from it. So we're ending up with you know, with essentially second-rate people, um, or people who have got ulterior motives. Somebody very bright might go into psychiatry, but he's got his eye on an academic career. That's that's what he's got mapped out. Others go into psychiatry because they recognise well, this is an easy way to make. Heaps of money, and I, you know, these are very bad justifications. So yeah, I think uh, the way medical students are indoctrinated is reprehensible. When you go in, you, you, you they should say to the students, "Today we're going to talk about mental disorder." Question number one: Is there such a thing? You see, and you'd start at that point. Um, unfortunately, Thomas Sass muddied those waters rather badly. Uh, but yeah, there is. Mental disorder is a real thing. Ask anybody who suffers. Ask sufferers. 
soldiers and, and civilians these days who are caught in war or tragedies or bushfires or floods as we've had here. And yeah, they suffer and they suffer for in the long term. So it's real. And I, I'm guessing that, you know, part of that indoctrination is the, the blame can be placed with the pharmaceutical manufacturers, can't it? Because, I, I'm, you know, we've heard from previous interviews that they, uh, you know, influence the way that textbooks are written and, you know, they influence the way that medical students are taught. So it's it's kind of a self-perpetuating thing, isn't it? Yeah, what the soldiers call a self-licking ice cream. Yeah, so it's the psychiatrists want the drug, um, the drug money, and the drug companies want the psychiatrists to endorse their product. And so this just becomes a very cosy little echo chamber and uh, there's nothing original allowed in it. Nothing, nothing is allowed to threaten the status quo. So that's why, you know, a, a, an institution like, as it is now, like MAD in America, uh, is very important because it is presenti- presenting alternative views, critical views, to a public which is being deprived of those views. Thank you, Jock. It's, you know, because of people like you that Madden America can have those kind of discussions. All right. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to thank Jock so much for taking the time to join us. As a reminder, his latest book, published in December 2021, is entitled Natural Dualism and Mental Disorder, The Biocognitive Model in Psychiatry, and it's well worth your time. So, Thank you so much for joining us, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.